And the answer is, well, okay, on that trivial ground, you're right, I can't blame that strictly on the Fed. But it is nevertheless the same factor, the same events, the same interference in, uh, with money and interest rates uh, that uh, we see in all other panics. Because if you look in the 19th century, you don't have a Fed, but you do in many cases have a government-established uh, national bank with government-granted monopoly privileges, which you had leading into the Panic of 1819, which you had leading into the Panic of 1837, and they create more money than, uh, than the free market would have created, and they push interest rates down lower. And I quote people, contemporaries from the 19th century, looking at these panics, and what they're describing, the phenomena they're describing, are exactly what Hayek describes about the business cycle, that we see an excess of investment in certain unsustainable lines, and then we've seen this bust, and everything's come crashing down. It's exactly the same thing. And you look at all the other panics, it's either, again, some national bank uh, that's authorized by the federal government, or it's the banking system in general, simply creating money out of thin air, which in effect puts the economy on a kind of sugar high that can't last. It doesn't have a real foundation. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's phony. And so all these panics are all explainable on the same grounds. Well, yeah, definitely. You would think it's really hard for people to realize that governments, by definition, don't produce anything. That you know, the only way they get things done is by taking, by produ- taking from productive members of society. Yeah, that's exactly, in fact, can I elaborate on that? Because, because in the same way that governments don't, don't have any resources and don't create anything, neither do central banks. So the very fact, the mere fact that the Fed or some central bank lowers interest rates, that doesn't magically create resources. All it does, if I lend out money that I've just created out of thin air, that doesn't create any additional goods. So it means whoever borrows that money, there are no additional goods for them to command with the money. All they do is there's an unchanged amount of goods in the economy, but now more dollars. So now whoever gets this new money gets to draw more of the economy's existing resource pool to himself. But we haven't increased wealth overall. We've just redistributed it around. Well, definitely. So, um, I mean, there's no way to you know, even disagree with that. I mean, central banks have no real power whatsoever. They just take from, they print money, and, you know, we make up for it through inflation. And uh, now we'll, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to ask some questions that we've uh, gathered from uh, some of the audience out there. So Kyle, want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Wood, do you have any suggestions for students who would like to spread the message of this book? Well, buy it and give it away. <laughs> but no, but other than that, um, I mean, basically, just uh, you know, don't, don't. When you're sitting there listening to people talk about the economy, most of them don't know anything they're talking about. Don't just let it go uncommented on. You know, when the, you know, just because you're you're afraid to to have a friendly debate or something. You know, at least make them aware that there is an uh, there is an alternative point of view. And again, it's a point of view that won the Nobel Prize. So it's not like it's some crazy point of view that just you hold, or you know, you're some kind of an eccentric person for holding. It's a, it's a completely honorable point of view. And I would, I, but secondly, I would point out who are the people who actually predicted there would be a problem. I quote in my uh, in in Meltdown. I quote James Galbraith who said in the New York Times that of the 15,000 professional economists in the country, roughly, he estimates maybe a dozen saw this coming. Now, that's just, you know, maybe a dozen of the people he knows. But, I mean, there were hundreds of Austrian economists who saw it coming. And so overwhelmingly, the people who predicted that there would be a collapse are the same people who have been critical of the Fed, who have been critical of, of fiat money, that is money that can't be converted into anything, it's based on nothing, uh, it can just be printed up indefinitely by a printing press. It's all the people who basically hold our points of view are almost the only ones who weren't completely clueless. Now, I mean, that is a type of argument that I think gets people's attention, that the only ones who actually saw this coming overwhelmingly are the ones who have this particular theory as to what caused it. Whereas the people who now are instructing us and who now are trying to run our economy, those people, well, almost none of them saw it coming. So, I mean, how are they supposed to fix a problem they weren't even aware of? Exactly. Uh, Another question, Austin Brenneman, a member of the Young Americans for Liberty movement, wants to know, if you had to make a recommendation right now, would you encourage Dr. Paul to run again in 2012? Well, I asked him about this uh, Back in the summertime, and uh, you know, at that time he was he was saying, "Oh, you know, I 
he seemed down on the idea, but when I look back on it and I listen to think about what he actually said, he had, didn't actually rule it out. He just simply said, I, I can't even think that far ahead. Now, you know, he's not a politician, we know, in the, in the traditional sense, but at the same time, I wonder, was that a politician answer? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that means uh, maybe when time passes I'll give it some, some thought. I mean, you know, I, I would like to see it. I would like to see it just because I suspect that he's going to be so vindicated by the time 2012 runs, runs around that people are going to have to listen to him. And, uh, and plus, when you consider, by the time you know, let's say February, March of 08 rolled around, I feel like we were just finally hitting our stride at that point. Like we were really just getting going. We, we, we suddenly had a lot of people now who had been turned on to these ideas, were spreading. So if we'd had just a little more time, and you know, maybe there'd been some, some important personnel changes, let's say, I, I think the potential was really very great. And now we've got four years to keep building the base, and the Campaign for Liberty is holding events all over the country, I think he would have a very, very substantial base of support. So, and but maybe I'm just saying this because I'm selfish, and I just had so much fun during the Ron Paul campaign that I hated to see it end. You know, I, mean, I don't know if you were like me, but like, what do I do on my computer all day when there are no more YouTubes to watch and and news things yeah, to keep exactly. up with? You know, so I would just I think, but also you know, even if he didn't win, and I don't want to start it off by I don't want people to think that I think he can't win. I don't think that he can't win. I do think that he can win. But even if he didn't, I mean. What we saw in 2008 was that he has changed the landscape forever. The Federal Reserve System is now on the table. People talk about it. Peter Schiff has an in now, uh, partly because of Ron Paul, I think. A lot of us are getting hearings that we wouldn't have gotten uh, otherwise. I go on all kinds of radio shows, and I mean big-time radio shows, where the host knows all about the Fed. That was, that's because of Ron Paul. And so he, and, but beyond that, we got all people like you guys, Young people coming out of nowhere, huge, huge numbers of them who are hearing about this stuff for the first time. That's because of him. This was not. This did not go to waste. This is one of the great opportunities we ever had. So to, to have a chance to do that again, and and the prospect that I would say no, we shouldn't do it. You got to be crazy. We, of course we should. Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah. And this... uh, another question from Mark Suriano is: uh, What's your opinion of, on uh, gold-based? Uh, currency versus a fiat-based currency? <laughs> well, I mean, of course, I think a gold-based one is is uh, infinitely preferable because, um, and, and again, in Meltdown, I quote Henry Hazlitt, who, um, you know, of course, wrote Economics in One Lesson, but Hazlitt said, you know, there are a lot of people who have these tiny little technical criticisms of the gold standard. He said, but the fact is, a gold money is a money that cannot be arbitrarily interfered with or destroyed by politicians. And he said, now, this, this single merit makes all technical criticisms of the gold standard utterly trivial by comparison. And so, but my, my view, though, is not so much that we should go back to a gold-backed money because, uh, or a gold standard, per se. I mean, if people want that, that's fine with me. But a gold standard that would require the government to maintain it and, and to, to, to maintain the, the, the ratio of dollars to gold, I, I think is unrealistic because, you know, look at the politicians who we have in Washington. Which one of them, other than Ron Paul, would you trust to do that? I mean, what's to stop them from just going off the gold standard again or fiddling around with it or whatever? I mean, why would we trust them with it? Instead, I think we need to think in more radical ways. We need to think about what Hayek said toward sort of toward the end of his career, in the late 70s, he gave a speech, uh, actually in New Orleans, and, and the speech is reprinted in the Journal of Libertarian Studies in the late 70s. You can find it on Mises.org, and I, I quote it in Meltdown. Hayek said that, you know, we cannot ever again expect to get a good money from government. There's no reason for them to supply it to us. And he says, secondly, it is a mere historical accident that governments have come to supply money. It's not like the inherent nature of things requires government to do this. He says, governments supply us money not because of the civics textbook reasons you learn in school that the government aims to bring about the common good and so it gives us a good money that we can come on you know just don't even don't insult me with that the reason they want to control the money supply is so they can create money out of thin air and reward their friends with it i mean that's that's what it's for that's why the government monopolizes money and and given that given this is the case 
What we instead should do is look to the free market, and that the free market supplies every good we need, and it supplies it the most efficiently. So why don't we look for free market alternatives? And the way we start doing that is really to follow Ron Paul's advice, which is get rid of all sales and capital gains taxes on precious metals, which would serve to obstruct their use as money. And secondly, repeal legal tender laws. Those are, interfe- those are monopolistic interferences in the free market. Get rid of that because legal tender laws mean basically that, that government courts will not enforce contracts that require payment in gold because the, the person is, because of legal tender, is allowed to pay you in the depreciating dollar. So that makes it very hard for alternatives to pop up because all alternatives are at artificial disadvantages. Let's have a level playing field and let's see how the market deals with it. And, I'm, and we're already seeing various companies starting up that will, in fact, make gold transactions for you and you can have debit cards or whatever. I mean, this, could, this transition could be affected very swiftly by the free market.